Greetings and welcome back to room 303, AP English, our World of Ideas Lectures, Unit Number 5, Nature. This is our first essay from that unit, Lecture Number 26, Francis Bacon's The Four Idols. Now, this actually comes from the, from the uh, 1620 volume, The New Organon. Now, I've already given some uh, earlier prior lectures on Francis Bacon, one of those truly great intellectual forces of Western thought. Um, let's talk a few assumptions quickly. The first is, as I've mentioned, LearnStrong.net. Lectures 1 through 25 in the AP folder, the World of Ideas folder, I've already worked now 20, uh, 25 lectures. I really am going to hope that you've been following me for those lectures because I build so strongly off of that information, as well as my lectures in the Harvard Classics from um, about Bacon's full essays. And then I've given a detailed lecture on Bacon's of studies as well. All that provided for you in the World of Ideas folder. And I'm assuming all of that has been watched and flowed before you actually engage this text with me. Um, we also assume your uh, learn, knowledge of learning theory, the, the desire to connect new information to old information in meaningful ways. We do that in our active reading at level one. We answer the question, what does the text say? Level two, what does it mean? What is, uh, how can I relate to the text? Level three. At level one, paragraph summarizing is huge for us. At level two A, we'll mess around with themes, messages, and our big five. What does this text say about epistemology, what we can know, ontology, who we are, psychology, the study of the individual mind, sociology, the study of the group, and then finally theodicy, the existence of pain or evil or suffering in the world. And then at level 2B, we ask about the rhetoric. We'll get to that in a moment. And of course, when we pick up Bacon, he's a genius writer, and so we're going to pay attention to the rhetorical techniques he utilizes. And then finally at 3A, other texts we've studied, and then, of course, how we relate to this information ourselves personally. And that leads to our final assumption. I hope that you're really trying, and now that we're into the middle of the Jacobus volume, you're really trying to read this stuff on your own and then utilizing my help after the fact. Let's do some quick brief biography because I've spent so much time in earlier lectures talking about uh, this biography. Um, uh, uh, of course, the dates 1561 to 1626, Lord Verulam uh, is the other name, lived in an amazing time, as we have said, the, the English Renaissance and, and, and thereafter, um, and of course was a contemporary of Shakespeare. There's the whole authorship question that I've talked about elsewhere in my lectures on Shakespeare at LearnStrong.net. There are some people who have often wanted to argue that Francis Bacon is a good candidate for the writing of the Shakespeare plays if Shakespeare himself didn't do it. I'll let you guys get into that authorship question on your own. His essays of 1597 and of studies as being one of those is, of course, really important. His new organ on, or the new method, as we, were thinking, as we will think about it, from 1620, and that's where this essay comes from, is in many ways his attack on Aristotle, the notion of deductive reason, and the um, importance of what we call inductive reason. That is, that is to say, learning from observation. Now, Jacobus will argue, and I'm with you on page uh, 379 and following, but, um, Jacobus will argue that Bacon is often mistakenly credited with having invented the scientific method of inquiry into nature, but although he was right about the need for collecting and observing, he was wrong about their outcome. After all, one could watch an infinite number of apples and oranges, too, fall to the ground without ever having the slightest sense of why they do so. What Bacon failed to realize, and he died before he could get close enough to scientific observation to realize it, is that the creative function of the scientist as expressed in the hypothesis. The hypothesis, an educated guess about why something happens, is then tested by the kinds of observations Bacon recommended. Of course, we have said in our lecture on the differentiation of the value spheres in our senior A folder on LearnStrong.net, the introduction to the scientific uh, enlightenment period, that the scientific method of, of course, inventing that hypothesis, the collecting of data, and then the replicability of that data is fundamental to understanding the scientific method. Nevertheless, to continue. The Four Idols, this essay, is a brilliant work. It does establish the requirements for the kind of observation that produces true scientific knowledge. Bacon despaired of any thoroughly objective inquiry in his own day, in part because no one paid attention to the ways in which the idols strangled thought, observation, imagination. He realized that the would-be natural philosopher was foiled even before he began. Bacon was a far-sighted thinker. He was correct about the failures of science in his time. He was correct, moreover, in his assessment that advancement would depend upon sensory perception and on aids to perception, such as microscopes, telescopes, and the like. The real brilliance of this essay, The Four Idols, uh, lies in Bacon's focus not on what is observed, but on the instrument of observation, the human mind, which is why it's now in this unit 
uh, um, for us, uh, na nature, and of course we're drawing on our knowledges of our, our knowledge of mind in the pre in the previous uh, uh, section. Only when the instrument is free of error can we rely on its observations. Let's turn now um, to uh, to the idea of uh, rhetoric real quickly, and then we'll move on into the essay. Okay. Um, Francis Bacon's rhetoric. Well, I'm, I'm with you now on page 380. The key here is enumeration, right? That notion of um, you're, you're going to suggest something and then you're going to explain it in detail. I'll just read with you. The four idols, after a three-paragraph introduction, proceeds with a single paragraph devoted to each idol so that we have an early definition of each and a sense of what to look for. Paragraphs 8 through 16 cover only the issues related to the idols of the tribe, for example. The problems all people have simply because their people. Paragraphs 17 through 22 consider the idols of the cave, those particular fixations individuals have because of their special backgrounds or limitations. Paragraphs 23 through 26 address the questions related to idols of the marketplace, particularly those that deal with the way people misuse words, abuse, definitions. Go back to our conversations about Plato and Socrates defining your terms, right? The remainder of the selection treats the idols of the theater, which relate entirely to philosophic systems and preconceptions, all of which tend to narrow the scope of research and understanding. By the way, notice, always we'll have at the very end the summarization as part of the enumeration. Uh, the last um, paragraph on 381, not only is the work that we're about to read a landmark in thought, it's also, uh, it is also, because of its absolute clarity, a beacon will be Jacobus's language. We can still profit from its light. There is no question about that. This is an essay that rewards close scrutiny study and not just for its influences in scientific thought, but the way that it's going to help you as a writer, guys. You're going to become better writers if you read good stuff. One of the reasons why we have to read the classics. We can disagree with a whole lot of what Bacon and anybody else has to say, but it, of course, is incumbent on us to first of all know what he has to say. The four idols. Now here are the word idols. Let's get it out of the way. He's using a somewhat religiously latent term, all right? The word idols means something that you worship that is not healthy for you, okay? Or something that you venerate that is not healthy for you, all right? Let's go to work with it. Paragraphs 1 through 7. Four classes of idols and false notions interfere with the human mind's ability to perceive the truth. Opening idea. The best remedy for them is inductive reason. Idols of the tribe are distortions arising from the limits of human perception and understanding. Idols of the cave arise from individual idiosyncrasies and experiences. Idols of the marketplace are caused by the imprecision of language. Idols of the theater result from misleading philosophies and principles. So in the first seven paragraphs, we're going to get the full outline of the four idols. Okay? Paragraphs 8 through 16. Human understanding has several tendencies that comprise the idols of the tribe. So you can see now he's breaking it down. We impute more order and regularity to the world than it actually contains. We ignore evidence that conflicts with our perceptions. We base our perceptions on those phenomena that strike us most readily rather than a thorough examination of our surroundings. We muddy our observations with unjustified interpretations. What we believe is colored by our wishes. We trust our senses for information that should be obtained by experiment. And for those of you who are somewhat smiling already, thinking about Plato's cave allegory, of course, you should be thinking. We're going to get to the idols of the cave in a bit, actually. I'm with you on 384, just reading from paragraph number 10. He says it this way. Besides, independently of that delight and vanity which I have described, it is the peculiar and perpetual error of the human intellect to be more moved and excited by affirmatives than by negatives, whereas it ought properly to hold itself indifferently disposed towards both alike. Indeed, in the establishment of any tracts of the negative instance is the more forcible of the two. This simple idea will crush a whole lot of assumed beliefs going forward. Okay, paragraph 17 through 22, the idols of the cave. We just mentioned Plato, right? The idols of the cave come from an individual's physical and mental constitution as well as education and experience. The most important are men's gravitation towards a favorite subject, shaping their other ideas around it. Their tendency to attend too closely to either the similarities or the differences between things, their partiality to a particular age and its judgments, and their inclination to focus on the minute aspects of a thing while in ignoring the large and general, or, of course, vice versa. Uh, let's just jump real quickly to uh, a, a, reading, a, a reading comment here. I'm, a, I'm at the beginning of page, uh, paragraph 20 on page 388. There are found, he said, some minds 
given to an extreme admiration of antiquity. Here he's probably referencing more than any Aristotle. Others to an extreme love and appetite for novelty, that everything that's new is great. But few so duly tempered that they can hold the mean, what Aristotle would call the golden mean, neither carping at what has been well laid down by the ancients, nor despising what is well introduced by the moderns. So let's put it in our notes. Epistemological uh, 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 fallibilism is, is our term here. Balance, right? Balance. The appreciation of both sides. We've talked so much in 303 about it. Much of it is Baconian in his fundamental assertion. Paragraphs 23 through 26. Most troubling of all are the idols of the marketplace. Misconceptions that have crept in through words and names. So Wittgenstein, the great philosopher, will have so much to say about this idea of wordplay and language, right? Words tend to oversimplify what they represent. Some words name things that do not exist or that are ill-defined. Many, many will argue that many of our words that we use in mythology are like this. In fact, Socrates pointed out, when you use the word God, what actually do you mean? Some similar argument. Others, words, can be interpreted in a variety of ways and lack a clear specific meaning. Of course, by the time we get to Nietzsche, he will point out almost all words are this way, right? That words have this ability to be really amorphous and change and go all over the place. Just to finish, different classes of words, nouns, verbs, adjectives, contain different degrees of distortion, which is why it's hypercritical we define our language. Good writers will obviously do that. Paragraphs 27 through 28. Idols of the theater are not covertly and inevitably deceptive, like idols of the marketplace, but are presented to the mind by incorrect philosophies and methods of investigating the world. The preferable method of investigation would not rely on individual intelligence and reasoning, but on objective observation. And sociologically, what does this mean? A group of thinkers. Uh, yeah, um, it will be in the New Atlantis, Bacon, that will argue for the notion of the academy. That idea that we have a bunch of scholars working together to try to come up with some idea. The beginning, the birth of modern science in many ways happens here. Paragraphs 29 through 34, to finish now the essay and, 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 and the final concluding ideas. Most philosophies abstract too much from too little evidence, or vice versa. Some manipulate the facts to confirm with their belief, with their ideas. Others interweave science and superstition. Now it's here that Bacon starts to get himself in a little bit of hot water when he writes this thing. The last is most widespread and dangerous, as can be seen in certain Greek and subsequent schools that offer religious and other non-objective explanations for natural phenomena. Bacon was very careful to not say that Christianity has this problem, but he would critique, of course, the Greeks as having this problem of inventing stories to explain the unexplainable. Of course, it wouldn't take very long for any kind of an innovative mind to say, well, if it's true for the Greeks, why isn't it also true uh, for, for Christians? So that by Wordsworth, in our study of him, you can find again on learnstrong.net. He will say it in the world is too much with us. Great God, I'd rather be a pagan suckled in a creed I've worn. So might I standing on this pleasantly have glimpses that would make me less forlorn. That is to say, at least the Greeks got something right. They saw the world as somehow inhabited by all this energy. Whereas for Wordsworth, the Christian theology had become more about smells and bells, more about that first box as we talk about it in our Plato's lecture on theory of the forms. Um, I'll just go to now the end at, at paragraph 35. Human understanding can be cleansed of these idols' misconceptions for those who would enter the kingdom of man founded on science like the kingdom of heaven must come as a little child. Uh, uh, just to jump to the very end here on page 392 of your volume, paragraph 32. He says, and yet this third class consisting of those who, out of faith and veneration, mix their philosophy with theology and traditions, among whom the vanity of some has gone so far aside as to seek the origin of sciences among spirits and genie, so that this parent stock of errors, this false philosophy, is of three kinds. The sophical, the empirical, and the superstitious. Now, Bacon's playing with some serious fire here, no question. But, he continues, the corruption of philosophy by superstition in an admixture of theology is far more widely spread and does the greatest harm, whether to entire systems or to their parts. For the human understanding is obnoxious to the influence of the imagination, no less than to the influence of common notions. For this, for this conscientious and sophistical kind of philosophical 
of, of philosophy ensnares the understanding. But this kind, being fanciful and timid and half poetical, misleads it more by flattery. For there is in man an ambition of the understanding, no less than the will, especially in high and lofty spirits. Hey guys, remember when we said at AP, you are the stories, we are the stories, we tell, we retell, the stories we accept, we, what do we say? The stories we reject. Of course, Bacon playing around with this. Just to continue, of this kind we have among the Greeks a striking example in Pythagoras, though he united with it a coarser and more cumbersome uh, superstition. Although in Plato and his school, more dangerous and subtle. It shows itself likewise in parts of other philosophies in the introduction of abstract forms and final causes and first causes with the omission, in most cases, of causes intermediate and the like. Upon this point, the greatest caution should be used for nothing is so mischievous as the apiothis of error. And it's a very plague of the understanding for vanity to become the object of veneration. Yet in this vanity, some of the moderns have with extreme levity indulged so far as to attempt to found a system of natural philosophy on the first chapter of Genesis, on the book of Job and other parts of the sacred writings, seeking for the dead among the living, which also makes the inhibition and repression of it the more important, because from this unwholesome mixture of things human and divine there arises not only a fantastic philosophy, but also a heretical religion. Very met. It is, very meet it is therefore that we be sober minded and give to faith that only which is faith. Well, you can obviously see the beginnings of what we call the differentiation of the value sphere is about to happen. Just to finish now at level two, epistemologically, what's going on here? Well, clearly it's the fallibilist position and not the absolutist position. That is to say, I'm right and everybody else is wrong, or Aristotle is right and anybody else who believes in something other is wrong. The fallibilist position, I think I'm right but I could be wrong, is hypercritical. And here, maybe the birth is happening of that moment of the fallibilist position. Ontologically, what do we see here? Well, obviously, we long to know more. Curiosity is foundational to who we are. It's not a bad thing, it's a good thing. But we've got to be careful, we've got to have a method, right? The organ on the method. Psychologically, well, obviously our fears can paralyze us and then just lead us to believe what others are telling us. And obviously, sociologically, that is the key. We have to grow as a group together, but we've got to be willing to challenge the assumed views. And that's always a challenge, right, to do. What does this text say about theodicy and the pain and the suffering of the world? Well, two things. It is self-inflicted, often caused, not all of it, but often caused uh, by misunderstandings in our own science and in our own thinking. That is to say, not in the past we've said we've got to learn how to ask why did this happen not to me but for me. Bacon would argue you got to, we, we have to learn to ask why did this happen not to us but for us. At 2A, messages, lifelong learning obviously central here. Notice the idea that we have said in earlier lectures that were introductory to 303, you can go to learnstrong.net and find those on the homepage, that idea of, of recognizing you have something in your neck, an academic weakness. It requires what two things? We learn this from Bacon. First of all, honesty to admit that it's there. You can pretend like you're being a bad reader is not a big deal. It is a big deal. you got to have honesty to admit it. But honesty to admit is not enough, Bacon will argue. You have to have the courage to remove it, to work at removing it. And that's what we mean by this notion of lifelong learning. At the rhetoric side, notice the power of the enumeration and, of course, we ourselves have to learn to be more organized in our compositional attempts, no question. At 3A and how we're going to compare this to other titles, well, Plato and Aristotle immediately come to mind, right? It is so hard for moderns to escape the influence. And I don't know that we ever will. Bacon certainly is pointing us backwards as well as forwards, no question. We think as well of great, great thinkers. Newton comes to mind, Galileo comes to mind, obviously Darwin comes to mind, who we'll be reading in a bit. And leading to that differentiation of the value spheres. Go back to learnstrong.net and find that lecture on the introduction to the scientific enlightenment and see what we've got to say there about the separating of arts, morals, and science. And Bacon was real clear in his view that the church should have some power over the morals sphere, but over the arts, and maybe a little over the arts, but over the field of science, Bacon was adamant, as you just read. Bacon was adamant that there should be some separation, some differentiation between uh, science and those things governed by the church. Finally, at 3B, 
Which of these three idols has been the hardest for you, do you think, in overcoming the challenges? And then finally, what is that thing in your neck? This academic weakness, or weaknesses, obviously, right? And what have you done to remove it? Oh, obviously, you're engaged in it right now, and it's one more reason to say, let's read as much as we can and study as much as we can. Well, speaking of reading, now let's move to Charles Darwin in our next lecture and in our next reading. Maybe the most influential individual of the modern of the modern era. There's a lot of debate about that, but certainly Darwin is a very, very important one for us. We'll come back to talk about him next. Thank you.